when we were talking about uh, David Cheriandi's I've Been Meaning to Tell You in uh, class yesterday. When I was talking about it, it felt to me as if I didn't quite finish doing what I needed to do or to draw things together in a way that might be coherent and useful for you folks. So um, I've decided to just make a brief video uh, trying to finish off the lecture in a certain sense that I gave yesterday. Uh, I should soon, if not now, have the uh, uh, audio podcast version of that lecture up for you to check out as well, or of all the lectures really. So uh, this is a little addendum to that. Uh, if we have to sort of think about the outcome of reading uh, David Cheriandi's book uh, and what it is that we confront along with him thematically, conceptually, uh, at the center of, in, in some sense, of his book, um, I think it comes down to uh, a word we hear right at the outset, although we hear in a kind of negative sense, and that is the idea of belonging, of what it means to belong here. Uh, throughout the book, you'll see that belonging, in various contexts, is counterpointed with uh, a certain idea of estrangement or exclusion. And this is a bit of a what we might call a binary, at least an antithesis. We looked at uh, antithetical uh, structures in some of the sentences, the way in which oppositions are balanced and negotiated uh, in his words on the page. Uh, so too, in broader terms, we might think of the antithetical pairing of belonging and uh, estrangement as uh, forming uh, a key part of what it is that we're trying to encounter here. It's a main theme, we could say, in some ways. So uh, how does he do this? And uh, again, I'm summing up here. I'd invite us to go back to the... Uh, the audio portions, uh, the audio podcasts of the lectures, the audio reproductions of the lectures to uh, to kind of check this out and think about what we said. But uh, in essence, the way to understand his unfolding approach, or we could say a sort of nascent approach, it's like it's starting to emerge uh, throughout the course of the no of the sorry of the book, and uh, we uh, to borrow from one of his subtitles we arrive at something of uh, an idea of this approach uh, as, we get to the, as we get to the end. The whole book is a kind of extended approach to, and the word we used yesterday, in fact, was it's kind of recursive. It keeps approaching, turning back and moving forward, turning back and moving forward around certain stories uh, and encounters, uh, specifically with... Uh, the question of, uh, of race and racial identity uh, in order to understand uh, himself, his relationship to his daughter, and the way in which they, as uh, persons of mixed race, are positioned socially and culturally, uh, and identified socially and culturally. That's why we started with uh, this idea of interpolation, of hailing, uh, of uh, ways in which we are identified and subjected. Uh, within various kinds of social and cultural apparatuses. So at the end of the book, where we arrive, something about his method, if you want to call it that, that uh, he identifies is he says he wants to listen. There's a kind of listening that ties itself into, uh, into his writing practice, speaking, but mostly writing practice, how he writes. And uh, as he frames it, he's trying to listen to what he calls the hard truths of the world around him. So it's a difficult kind of listening practice. It's hard to be uh, accurate and attentive all the time. But that's essentially, I believe, what his prose, what his writing is trying to do, is to open itself up in a difficult way sometimes, in a challenging way, uh, to some kind of practice of listening to the world around him, listening to his family, listening to himself. Uh, what he, uh, the way he, he, he characterizes, I think, this method is, uh, it's, I believe, page 83 of the edition you have. Uh, we talked about this in the lecture yesterday. But uh, he characterizes his method as answering back, of emerging out of a kind of silencing, which we experience with him in the first three pages of the text, uh, with the, that uh, experience at uh, 
the water tap, uh, where he is uh, interpolated uh, racially, uh, although without racially marked terms even being uh, foregrounded in that discourse. It's as if they're implied. And in that kind of implication, that sort of enforced quietude in that language, you also get a sense uh, of his own experience of being silenced and of being unable to speak. Remember the title of the book is I've Been Meaning to Tell You. He's trying to, as I said, this is a nascent, nascent kind of work. He's trying to approach the whole idea of telling or of disclosure. Uh, he means to tell and he's working on generating some kind of meaningful response, uh, some form of telling uh, that answers to, that's responsible, that is responsive to and sort of ethically careful, uh, that's responsive to or answerable to uh, the the mixture and uh, of uh, around his sense of identity, and to uh, the ways that responds to the ways in which that those various identities or the identity that he is um, given or that's forced upon him and his daughter uh, can be uh, encountered. So, uh, what does it sound like? That was uh, some of the ways in which we were close reading and uh, thinking about uh, his language were attempts to try and frame or to understand this practice of answering back and of listening to hard truths in language. So uh, we looked at some of his sentence rhythms. Uh, we came up with um, various tactics, I guess, or kinds of verbal practices that emerge in his writing consistently. Uh, there's a lot of interruption, for example, and qualification takes place. A certain kind of hesitancy works itself into his sentences at times. There is also a certain interest in balance and in uh, juxtaposition. We saw how he used antithesis, for example, or looked a bit at his sentence rhythms, the cadences of his sentences. Uh, and how they suggest uh, something about his approach. Uh, there's lots to say about this, but um, one of the uh, better ways to understand it might be to think about how he is managing, or perhaps even better, negotiating with, negotiating with, in language, uh, and again, think about this as listening, as a kind of back and forth, as some kind of reciprocity, or in terms of touch, I framed it as the haptic, how we push on things, touch things, and how they push back at us, um, that that answering back uh, engages with, negotiates with what he calls um, a condition of estrangement. That's a phrase that comes when he's talking about uh, his reading of James Baldwin, for example. Or uh, I pointed to a phrase he uses that feels a bit like what we call a contradiction in terms or an oxymoron. Uh, where he uh, talks about uh, this, the kind of subtle moments of uh, racism that he feels around him. Sometimes he can't quite put his finger on it. Sometimes he can't quite say exactly what's going on. It's difficult because they're often so tacit or so subtle. But he characterizes this as uh, giving him a certain familiar unease. A certain, so it's specific to him, a certain familiar unease. Uh, I attached to this, uh, this phrase an idea from literary criticism uh, called defamiliarization. So if you think of that word familiar connected both to a certain kind of comfort or the uh, a normality or um, uh, everydayness of a certain kind of shared uh, habituated um, normal that we all experience and that's kind of undifferentiated. Uh, the idea of the familiar, one of the things that happens uh, it, at these moments is you, uh, of, let's say, uh, racist encounter that he describes, is that what passes for familiar, or better, what passes for neutral, is in fact absolutely not that. That seeming neutrality or balance often covers over a really disruptive and even hurtful um, a sense of uh, being identified, being racially marked, being told who you can and cannot be, for example. So uh, those moments are 
uh, arguably moments of discomfort, certainly, or of uns they're unsettling, we'd say. Uh, the literary term for this, uh, and it moves in a number of senses here, is defamiliarization. The familiar, the normal, is disrupted by something. So this is something you can look for in his prose as well, in David Cheriandi's prose. How is uh, a certain kind of estrangement, a certain kind of provocation or disruption, uh, maybe interruption, enacted in his sentences? Uh, certainly you can see it around... Um, uh, the moment when his uh, son is uh, sort of racially hailed is uh, called a racist term, an epithet, uh, that I'm not reproducing here now, and I explained in class why I'm not going to do that. But uh, after a long kind of, I characterize it as pastoral description of sort of family discussion, of family outings in the in the late spring and the, the emergence of summer. It's very lively, it's very warm, it's very comforting. You get that whole paragraph ended, pointed up, and the sentence that closes the paragraph works this way as well, with this disruptive, hurtful racial epithet. So that's a moment of a kind of defamiliarization. It's a tactic that's used here. Uh, rather than resolve this uh, sense of estrangement, though, what Cherry Andy says he wants to do is to discover or attend to or find out something about what he calls, uh, in relation to his daughter, uh, a luminous specificity. That is, uh, it seems to him that the problem with the kind of masking, or I said it was ideological work, a kind of false consciousness, the kind of masking that uh, sameness and universalizing humanistic language uh, around neutrality or objectivity tends to um, enable, uh, what it tends to enable is, uh, are the very kinds of racial exclusions and um, disenfranchisements and um, uh, uh, othernesses that he wants to uh, somehow reconcile himself with. But again, rather than sort of fall into that uh, another version of that kind of sameness, to say we're all alike. Instead, he emphasizes what he wants to see as a luminosity, as some kind of creative emergence uh, in, uh, in those differences and in our specificities and in this plurality. So uh, the kind of humanism, if that's what you want to call it, that Cherry Andy is pushing toward is, uh, we could say it's pluralistic or uh, differential in some sense, if you want to be a bit abstract about it, but it sort of leans in a little bit to those differences and to that complexity. So that means that he has to negotiate, uh, as I was suggesting, rather than simply accept. Uh, I'm just going to uh, gesture at uh, something he says. Here's the book on page uh, 55 in this edition, the first edition here. The fact is, he says, uh, to his uh, daughter uh, when he's, tr or he at least writes in this book in a kind of um, uh, imitation of talking directly, of telling. Uh, diegesis, remember, is the word for that. Um, he's trying to talk about what it means to be of color or to have a particularly racially marked background or a mix, as he describes it. The fact is, he says, that I've never actually named you one way or the other. So that there's a kind of we've talked a bit about binaries already in this video and in class certainly there's a kind of either or that he's presented with you can hear it in his sentence one way or the other and it feels like you have to make a choice or you have to make what are called ontological claims to say what one is or as he puts it in the rest of the sentence I never told you authoritatively he's an author after all but there's something about cultural authority here never told you authority what you are that's that ontological claim racially speaking. I had forgotten, he says a little further down, that racial identity is so rarely a matter of personal choice. Now we're thinking about that idea of negotiation and choice, so that's a, a, a sort of a challenging moment here uh, in the text, but uh, the thing to notice is that um, although it's not personal choice in a kind of relative sense, that you don't necessarily, you aren't necessarily able to choose fully and completely uh, how you identify yourself. You are identified, interpolated was the word we used, uh, from outside by various kinds of voices and uh, various others and various forms of 
uh, govern governance and of uh, institutional and social structure. So they identify you, people, institutions, all kinds of things. Uh, you do have some kind of agency here, and that's what he's trying to recover. She does have some choice. Uh, and in fact, answering back in the way that Cherry Andy is trying to negotiate with these complex registers of uh, race that he's engaging with here, uh, is a matter of uh, not exactly choice, but certainly of creative will. That's the luminosity that might emerge here. That it's not to be contained, not to be orchestrated, not to be organized, absolutely, but finds its way out through cracks and moments of estrangement and otherness and defamiliarization. Uh, so those, uh, even if you are being called uh, a name, there's a way, uh, Cherry Andy suggests, uh, notice how his son, for example, writes that uh, short essay, lyric essay on the beautiful day that he... Uh, that he reproduces in the in the in the book here, um, there are creative ways, lyrical ways, luminous ways to push back at that kind of naming. Or I think better if you look at that passage uh, uh, in the book, there are ways um, to rename or to negotiate with those processes of naming. Because remember, after all, his son is uh, named by the teacher and mentor who helps him to uh, get. Uh, through to some kind of creative response to the kind of situating that's happening to him. So sentences themselves then are negotiations, if you want to think of them that way, in this book. Uh, they are in other books as well, but in this book in particular. All right, uh, so um, uh, I ended it rather quickly uh, with um, a description of what I suggested were different registers of the racial, ways in which uh, race is managed and articulated uh, in public, for a reading public, uh, in a kind of spatial public, in community, uh, in various configurations of uh, social interaction. Uh, I gave us six registers, and I'm going to do it again here now, just so you have these uh, a little more specifically in front of you. The first I suggested, and this is where we kind of start with in a course like this, I called the semiotic. The semiotic. That is that there are ways in which race is represented and represents itself. Ways in which in particular language signifies. So semiotics is the study of signs, of signification, of representation. So we're talking about semiotic registers of race. We're thinking about ways in which images or uh, maybe visual, maybe auditory kinds of things, maybe words, uh, frame and depict racial identities. We can think of those uh, curse words again. We can think about how a word here, a keyword in Cherry Andy's book, like belonging, starts to um, find, find itself framed and repurposed in various kinds of contexts. The ways in which... Um, uh, Appearance as well is managed here, how you dress, uh, your skin tone, uh, various kinds of visual uh, manifestations, uh, forms of the visual are uh, coded are, uh, and kind of accrue or attach themselves, start to belong to uh, different kinds of cultural and social meaning. So that's the semiotic in operation. And when we're doing close readings, we often tend to emphasize this idea of codes or of representation or of meaning making. Uh, maybe um, it's not an exact kind of connection, but one of the things I've been talking about in class too is a hermeneutic or interpretative activity. And in a way, um, how a hermeneutic kind of approach is asking how uh, those um, connections between form and meaning get made. And notice that's a, a key uh, point in how you produce close readings of text. You want to think about those connections. So this is uh, dealing with representation. The next register of the racial, we might even want to call these technologies of the racial. So think about this. Uh, the next one I mentioned is the discursive. So, And we want to distinguish maybe the idea of discourse from the idea of uh, merely representational language. You'll discover that's 
to be absolute about these things is very difficult. But if we just in a, in a kind of a bit of thought experiment here, um, when we're talking about discourse, we're talking about the ways in which those meanings or those signs and symbols circulate in the world that have a kind of worldliness. Uh, think about, uh, we were talking about speech acts, so the ways in which uh, that woman in the scene with the tap wants to be overheard. Her language circulates in the world. It's not just uh, a kind of abstract uh, structure that exists poetically on the page or something like that, but it moves out into the world. So the ways in which uh, language circulates, we're thinking about the discursive. And uh, race is often framed in terms of circulating language. I've just suggested one example of that in the book. You should look for others. Uh, the sort of next uh, register of the race that I talked about is the corporeal, uh, the ways in which bodies act both, uh, and this is a, maybe an aspect of the material or an aspect of the worldly, but ways in which bodies act as, uh, you might think of these as interfaces or our, our flesh as kind of membranous, the ways in which our bodies are, are, are articulated, uh, are shaped, and also engage in a kind of interchange with uh, with the world uh, is uh, a little more specific than merely thinking about the discursive. So we're thinking about kind of bodily structures, our organs, our skin. Again, it's kind of obvious in some ways in the Cherry Andy book when he talks about DNA and the ways in which we are genetically coded, the ways in which uh, our bodies get mapped onto a kind of global geography of where you come from. That's the question that uh, locates itself uh, genetically uh, around uh, depictions of the body here. Uh, it's, it's also, you might think of that, uh, where you come from question in terms of the body as what we call logically a kind of genetic fallacy. There's no reason why how you look should be connected to who you are, although we do that. And uh, in that passage I just read to you, notice how Cherry Andy says, I had forgotten that you can't choose your body in a certain sense. Although you can, you can dress different ways, you can modify your body, you can present yourself in various ways, you can uh, uh, medically or uh, otherwise um, interrupt and intervene in how your bodily processes operate. So it's not just that the body is a given, but rather that it's a site of, to use a word I've already used, negotiation, and it's particularly relevant thinking around race. The next two registers that I offer to us uh, were, had to do with uh, different senses of the material. So we're kind of departing quite a bit now from the, um, from the idea of the semiotic and from signification and instead thinking about how things materialize in the world. Uh, we can think about uh, genealogy and family or heritage. It's connected to corporeality, but it's uh, also much more social and sociocultural, I guess we could say. Uh, you could think about uh, history. Notice how history and kind of thinking about what is true or false history in this book, getting it right, whether it's family history or national history, uh, plays into uh, how it is that um, one is uh, identified and how one identifies. Uh, we negotiate with different kinds of ways in which histories play through our uh, attention. Uh, so this is a part of the kind of critical operation of things, but it's, it's maybe more of an outgrowth of the kinds of close reading that we're uh, practicing. Materialist readings tend to think more about context uh, than uh, about text, although the two are enmeshed, obviously. Uh, the other kind of materiality I was thinking about had to do with uh, community and the ways in which we socially uh, orchestrate ourselves uh, in the world, you might think about architecture. You might even think in this line, and maybe this is a different sense of the material too, about um, technologies uh, in the sense of maybe electronic technologies or the machinic, how it is that various machines, and this might seem a little peculiar, but think a little bit about uh, how uh, sugar, for example, raw cane sugar comes up in quotation marks on the second page of David Cherry Andy's book, uh, something you can uh, think about, which doesn't really get mentioned, except he does talk about his Caribbean heritage and so on, is that in Caribbean plan on Caribbean plantations, sort of historically, sugar is uh, a major uh, crop and has a lot to do with the uh, economic uh, security of 
populations and of countries. It's very colonial. It's also racially marked. Enslaved uh, Afro-diasporic populations were the laborers on sugar plantations and sugar farms. So when he's in some kind of Whole Foods uh, looking at fancy uh, kale and things like that and looking up drinks that say they have real cane sugar in them, there's something in a kind of just spectral way of that, um, that history that's drawn in. So there's something material that we can engage in. This is this kind of material analysis that starts to play into how race is figured. Uh, although figuration, again, is a kind of semiotic, hermeneutic sort of uh, pursuit, right? How one thing represents another, that's figuration, right? Finally, the last thing I mentioned for us to consider is the spatial. Notice how space is orchestrated. When he is interpolated, he, when he is hailed, when he uh, experiences, like James Baldwin, let's say, that condition of estrangement, or when he identifies as a different sort of what he calls coolie, uh, uh, with uh, migrant Chinese workers and the railroad, he's thinking in terms uh, of how national and cultural space is organized, is shaped, and shapes our movements. So he's afraid for his safety walking in certain neighborhoods or when people call out to him or um, uh, see him within different kinds of spatial arrangements. Uh, maybe the question around belonging is how does one belong in space? Um, various spaces, how is that space of belonging produced rather than produced for you? How do you create or concoct it? So uh, that's a lot of stuff, and I've gone on for about 20 minutes longer than the five minutes I started to think about, and I'm going to stop here. But uh, I hope this helps to kind of wrap up and draw together some of the threads that we ran out of time uh, for in... Um, in class, and I hope that it helps you to start to think about how you perform your own close readings of texts like, uh, like David Cheriandi's uh, I've been meaning to tell you. Take care.